Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. It's good to see you all here. Um, I haven't done any one of these for a while now, so if any of you don't know me, my name's Andy. Um, I'm just one of the regular members of the congregation here, and I'm pleased that um, Alf is here and will be um, leading <coughs> the service and sacrament later. You'll have to bear with me. I've got a little bit of a croaky voice, but hopefully it's going to keep going. Uh, let's uh, open in prayer. Lord, thank you that we can uh, come here this morning to worship you, Lord. Um, it's amazing that uh, wherever we are, you are, Lord, and particularly when we gather as a congregation of your people, um, we can often feel a real presence of your spirit here with us. And we pray that we'll feel that this morning, Lord, that you'll speak to each one of us through, through the worship, um, through the talk to the junior church, and particularly through the sermon that Alf's going to bring to us later, and that you'll just... We'll feel that real clear, quiet voice speaking to each one of us in our hearts this morning. And we pray for any who aren't here for whatever reason, whether that's holiday, illness, or um, just bus general busyness, Lord. We just um, pray that they are feeling your presence wherever they are as well. I ask these things in your name. Amen. Um, we're going to start by singing a couple of songs back to back. Um, opening with uh, Bless the Lord, O My Soul, and then following on with Oceans. Um, feel free to stand or sit as you're able, uh, and all the words will be on the screen. So thank you, music group. Would you like to stand?
me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand. My guide, where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your rest. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is where the borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Jesus, yeah, my God, and I will call upon your name. rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours, and you are mine. You're all in good voice this morning, particularly junior church. Good singing, well done. Right, <clears throat> I've got some um, notices to give out now. Uh, hopefully most of you had them by email. There are some printed copies out in the lobby if you haven't. Um, a couple of things I just want to highlight. Um, the first one is for those of you who know the Hillmans, um, Ayla's getting baptized next Sunday and Heather's very happy for us to go down and be there for that baptism. I know there's a few people going down 
Um, four o'clock, I think the actual baptism is. Claire, that's right, isn't it? Um, so if you want to go down and um, talk to Claire, she can give you the details afterwards. Sorry, Claire, dropping you in it. Um, <clears throat> next one on the notices is there's an extraordinary circuit meeting on Tuesday, the 25th of July, 7.30 at Copleston. So um, that's specifically to discuss uh, two matters. I think there might be a few other minor things, but the two main key matters are uh, leasing of the manse whilst we haven't got a minister uh, and next steps in the stationing process. For those of you who aren't died in the war Methodists, that's the process we go through to get a new minister. Um, so everyone's welcome to attend. Um, if there are any matters that need voting on, then only the members of the circuit meeting can vote, but you're more than welcome to come along and express your opinion and get take part in the discussion. Um, so if you want to come along to that, you'd be more than welcome, and it'd be really helpful to get everyone's views, particularly on stationing. Um, I'm not sure Roger will thank me for that, but it'd be good to uh, get everyone involved as much as possible. Uh, Tuesday 25th, 7.30 at Cobbleston. And then the final thing, just to highlight, is... There is a house group barbecue, which is open to everyone, so don't worry if you don't attend the house group, on the 26th of July, 7pm at Stockholm Farm. If you aren't members of the house group and want to attend, please can you just let Phil and Louise Weber know, just so they've got a rough idea of numbers for catering. Um, so that's uh, Wednesday the 26th at 7pm. So you could do circuit meeting on the Tuesday and then go to the barbecue on the Wednesday. Have a full, full week. Okay. Right, let's uh, move on. So, right, I brought a prop with me. Bear with me. Rachel calls this one of my geeky work things. But, um, I'm not sure it is. Junior, Junior, I'll just stand in front of the microphone. Junior Church, have you any idea what this is for? I know James knows, but he's not allowed to participate. <laughs> any ideas? Do you want me to take, oh, I'll take the lid off and you can have a better look? Hang on. It is something to do with weather. That is a clue. Something to do with weather. Is that any... Does that give you any better idea? I'll show you this. does measure the air pressure, yes. Do you know what it's called? No. Do I know what it's called? Yes. Oh, I see the whispers are going along the back row. There's a bit of cheating going on. So this is called a barograph, and you're absolutely right. This is for measuring the pressure. We don't actually use these anymore. We've now got some boring electronics that don't look anywhere near as good. Um, but essentially, this drum rotates. It's clockwork. This just goes round. So this rotates for a week. And then the atmospheric pressure presses down on this sealed unit here. And that makes the pen go up and down, depending on what the pressure is. And then you get a pressure reading. But let me put this down before I break it. So we don't use those anymore, so work was getting rid of one, so I said yes, much to Rachel's delight. <laughs> so it's sat at home at the moment. Um, so atmospheric pressure, what does that mean, Lily? You, had, you said atmospheric pressure, do you know what it means? Yeah, <laughs> pretty good, good guess, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. So what, what that means is above us, all the air, before you get into space, actually exerts a pressure on us, it weighs down on us. It doesn't feel like it does, does it? Because we are perfectly adapted to it and we just wander around during the day and we don't notice it at all. But it causes other effects. What else do you think it causes in terms of weather? Charlotte's trying to get Evie to say something now. <laughs> any ideas? Yeah, because that's the grown up. Is any ideas what atmospheric pressure causes in terms of weather? Uh, mm, sort of, Craig, yeah, linked to that. Wind. wind, wind is the main. So atmospheric pressure changes are what drive most of the weather across the world. So uh, you have low pressure and high pressure, as you've seen on the weather charts, and the atmosphere tries to equalise that, so it moves from low pressure to high pressure, try and balance it out. And that causes wind, it causes all the um, moisture in the atmosphere to move around, and that, coupled with the spin of the Earth, is why we get all the weather that we get. But for most of us, we go about our lives completely oblivious that there is this thing called atmospheric pressure. It doesn't make any difference to us. We don't notice it. We just might notice some effects of it, like the wind, or if there's rain because of the fronts that are coming through caused by the atmospheric pressure. And for many of us, I was thinking that is a bit like God, isn't it? God is around us. He's everywhere. 
but many of us take absolutely no notice. We don't even realize he's there sometimes. But then if we're a little bit observant, we might not start noticing some of the effects of the things that God might do in our lives. Um, and for when we're talking to our friends, a lot of them will say, oh, well, God doesn't exist. There's no evidence that he exists. You know, we can't see him. We can't touch him. Um, he doesn't do anything. And you might actually be able to say, well, actually, no. He has done some specific things in my life, and these are the things that I can point out that proves to me that God exists and is part of why I have my Christian faith. Even though he's invisible and you can't see him, you can see what he does, and he's very much at work in the world. So that's what I wanted just to share with you guys this morning. Um, hopefully that's helpful. Um, we're gonna, I'm just going to pray for you, um, and then we'll sing before you go out to your um, Sunday morning classes. Okay. Lord, thank you for our junior church. Um, Thank you for their commitment. They come along uh, every week, Lord. Um, Always seem really enthusiastic um, up for getting involved in things that go on in the church, Lord, and and really benefit the rest of us as well, particularly with their singing and their dancing and their enthusiasm, Lord. I thank you for the teachers who um, week after week prepare whatever they're going to do on the Sunday morning, Lord, and put that time in to bring our children up knowing about you, and uh, encouraging them to have a personal faith in you, Lord. I pray as they go out uh, in a bit this morning, um, that they'll just have fun, but also learn more about you, Lord, this morning. Amen. Uh, So we're going to sing again. This is our God, um, the Servant King, from heaven you came. And uh, if you want to go out after that, Junior Church, thank you.
just let uh, Junior Church go out, um, and then we'll have the Bible reading for this morning. Okay. <clears throat> so the reading for this morning is uh, Romans 8, verses 1 to 11, um, and I'll be reading from the NIV. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that righteousness, the righteousness requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who did not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Amen. Um, we're just going to have a time of prayer now. Um, and then I'll ask Alf if he'd like to come up and give us a sermon. But um, I'll, I'll leave some time for us to um, either say prayers in our hearts or out loud, but is there anything anyone wants to just raise and um, ask specifically for the congregation to remember in prayer um, to start with? I know Colin Andrews is in hospital, so we'll remember Colin. It's nice to see David back. Good morning, David. Amen. Um, Sharon, Carl, and Noah are just starting transition to adopt a new girl starting today. So I just want to let that first and Chris and Thank you. Remember Barry at this time, he's not feeling too well. Okay. If anything does come to mind as we pray, then in the the time of open prayer, feel free to share it. But um, let's let's start pray. I'll um, open and close. Lord, thank you that um, you're always there to listen to each one of us, Lord. Um, you're always there to uh, take and share the burdens that we have in our life. Um, sometimes it feels like it's just always requests, Lord, and I, I pray that we remember to thank you um, and to praise you as well as ask for things, Lord. Um, this particular time this morning, there are a number of things that we've raised uh, that are going on in the life of the congregation. We just ask you to step into these situations now. So... Um, we're thankful for Sharon, Carl, uh, and Noah as they're starting the uh, adoption process, uh, welcoming in a new member of their family. Um, we just pray that you'll be with them at this time, help it to go as smoothly as these things can, and that um, the little girl will, will settle into the family really quickly. Uh, we pray for Colin Andrews um, as he's in hospital. Pray that you'll um, work with the doctors and nurses to um, get him fit and well soon so that he can return home. Uh, we pray for... Um, Barry, who's not feeling too well at the moment, that you'll just um, be with him and Julie and the rest of the family and help him to recover quickly. Um, be with Ken as well during this time. Um, and particularly we pray for, <clears throat> as Claire mentioned, the, the family of the man who died at Lee Cross in the, in the car accident last night. Um, we don't know who they are, what they're going through, what their situation is in life, Lord, but um, we pray that somehow they'll feel uh, a closeness, um, 
a sense of uh, somebody standing there with them during this time and help uh, the local Christians in that area to get involved and just show compassion and love and, and support them in any way they can, Lord. We have a little time now as well that we can um, either pray to you in our hearts or out loud as well for other things that are going on in our life. Lord, we thank you for um, that you've heard all those prayers that have just been prayed either out loud or silently, Lord. Um, and we thank you that you guarantee that you will answer each one of them as well. Lord, I want to thank you for um, any donations that have been put in the collection either before or after the service, Lord. Um, please help the church leaders to spend that money wisely um, on the running of the church and outreach into the local community, Lord. Um, and we pray particularly for Alf now as he comes to um, share your word with each one of us, that you'll just uh, be with him uh, and speak through him to each one of us as we've already prayed this morning. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, Alf. Morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm just sitting there thinking, 27 years ago, I led a mission team into this circuit, or the, what was the original circuit, 27 years ago, and uh, it seemed to have come back nearly every year since. <laughs> so, I must not have done a good job at the start. But it's good to be with you uh, this morning. And, and to share this word, and then to lead us in the sacraments. My text is from Romans chapter 8, and I'll just put a caveat here. I didn't think, um, at the moment, on the lecturing readings, we're following, the epistle reading is following Romans. And a few weeks ago, when I was started to uh, look at what the readings were for Sunday, I um, oh, thought it's, it's Romans, I'm not going to do Romans, because it's been done to death. Um, it's an easy passage when you, if, you're, if you're an evangelist to turn to, uh, to Romans, and especially I think that week was Romans 5. And um, so, no, anyway, as the week went on, as I prayed about the message, as I uh, started to think about the service, <laughs> I ended up um, looking at Romans. So I'm still in Romans, and I bring uh, today's reading, this Romans chapter 8, and my text is, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And do you feel, do you feel set free? I'm reading, 
I'm a lazy reader. I'm hoping I'll, I'll be able to get down to it in a m month or two. So I download books onto my iPad and I listen to them. And I can be doing something else, looking, feeding the rabbits while I'm listening to uh, things like uh, The Confessions of Augustine. And uh, it's a book that's been on my shelf ever since I inherited it in somebody's library. And I've, I've wanted to read it, but I haven't dared start. So I've downloaded it onto the iPad and I listen to it. And it is really quite, well, it's a bit fruity, actually. He's, he is confessing. He's come to faith, um, thanks to a, a loyal and praying mother who really challenged him and prayed him into the kingdom. But he had a wayward youth, and he describes that in detail, in part of it, and other sins that he has been afflicted with over the years. Really declaring the freedom that he has found through finding Christ, for actually submitting to Christ uh, uh, after this wayward life that he, he, he led. But many leaders, uh, historically, many leaders of the church down the years have been, have failed in their ministry. Take the Methodist church, good old John Wesley. Um, he went to America and he was going to set the world on fire. And he came back with his tail between his legs, in disgrace, in fear. If he'd have stayed in America, they would have killed him. That's what he feared. So he ran as fast as he could back to England. Uh, and he had a wonderful theory on baptism, though. Uh, he, he did do infant baptism. Uh, I know that's questionable here but he did do infant baptism and um, his theory was you should use the coldest water you can find you dunk them in three times fully immerse three times and then if they lived they definitely was blessed by God <laughs> that was his theory on but he'd fallen out over giving communion uh, to someone and and they, they returned but it was while on his outward journey he came across the Moravians that he saw faith in action, and especially in a storm where the ship almost sank. And he saw in these Moravians a real devotion. Everybody else was tying themselves, lashing themselves to, to bits of wood so they uh, were secure. And these Moravians went up on deck and just prayed. And the storm was roaring about them and they just prayed. So he, he, he failed, and he looked for a replacement. As he was getting older, you know, the church had kind of established, and he, he looked for a replacement. And he had Fletcher and Maidley, is probably the one that everybody talks about. But I, I ministered in Haworth, and William Grimshaw, who was the curate at Haworth, revival happened at, uh, in Haworth at the same time the Wesleyan revival was happening. And, and uh, Grimshaw became, uh, well, founded a, a Methodist church. And uh, he served a thousand communions on one Sunday. That's how much revival was going on. And if you've been to Haworth, it's a bleak, or if you've read, read Wuthering Heights, it's a bleak place, I can tell you. The books are right. Uh, but, but good old William Grimshaw... He, he became a curate because that's what happened. When you were, if you were first in the family, then you maybe got the title and the land. If you were second in the family, you went into the army. If you were third in the family, you went into the church. And he, he became a, 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 a priest in the Church of England. But he had nothing to give anybody. When a couple came who'd lost a child, he just said, oh, cheer up and get on with it. That's all he had. The only thing he was interested in, uh, in those early years, was fishing and shooting, and he did like the ladies. And that, there were his three interests. He had nothing to offer by way of faith. But he met Jesus, and it turned his life around uh, completely. And he was good as your minister, because if he didn't turn up on Sunday, he came to your house on Wednesday to ask why. <laughs> so he went in fear 
Anyhow, William Grimshaw died before Wesley. They all outlived him. And that's why we have a conference. Because they, they met in conference. Wesley started the conferences. They met in conference and says, we want no one person at the head of the church anymore. And that's why we elect a president every year. don't know if you know that. But uh, because they said, we don't want another Wesley. We don't want somebody who uh, keeps us hugged tied down. It might have been better if they had it done, but never mind. And one thing I love about the scriptures is the honesty of the scriptures. And, uh, and, and we have all these characters in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, and they, they're flawed. Uh, my favorite one is, is David, the great King David. He, he, he was a man after God's own heart. That's what God said of King David. But he was a man who was flawed. He was a shocking parent. You're a shocking parent when your children try to kill you, aren't you? Hmm? You haven't done a good job. And, and, well, read his story and read, you know, look into the back, not just into the kind of stuff we, we bring to the fore. He, he wasn't a perfect person at all, but he was the man that God chose. And he was God, a man who followed in God's heart. But many a time he had to flee out of fear of his life whether it be from Saul or whether it be from David. Sorry, or from Absalom, as he was trying to, that was his son. He, he must not have brought him up right. And then there's Paul. There's Paul. And what I've found as I've been reading Romans this time is the tension that there's going on in Paul. He's wrestling with this text. I don't know if you know, but Romans was written as his CV. What Paul dis was planning on doing was going to Rome, freely going to Rome, and then from there making that his base to come out to Spain and then on maybe over to here. Um, that was his plan. And so he wrote this letter to the Romans telling them what had, he believed, describing to them, because they, they were predominantly a Jewish Christian church um, so that when he got there he didn't have to waste time proving that he was kosher he wanted them to know what he actually thought what he believed what had led him to the point where he was and, and I think as as Paul writes this letter he's wrestling with some of the issues that are there as much as describing them as it is it, the path that he's on he says in, in Romans 7, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, I do. Flawed, isn't it? Even though there's this great church leader who's having great success in his mission, he's still wrestling, and he's wrestling with what he's come to believe. Remember, he was born in the right family. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He persecuted the church because he believed, because he believed in the authenticity um, of the faith that he was in. And he thought, this has come to wreck it. And so he's, he's kind of on a downer, I think, when he's going through 5, 6 and 7. And, and I bet a lot of pastors actually will skip those passages. But then you come to Romans 8. What great verse, isn't it, to start with? We get to Romans 8, where it says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He set his credentials out, and that's his truth. That's where he's come from. He's worked through the argument of salvation, how God, through a nation, through one man, brought a nation which brought a saviour into the world, not just for the Jewish faith, but for all, a saviour for all. Abraham, again, a flawed person, very much, but the man that God chose. And I used to, you know, you read, don't you? Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. And it is an admission. For the first time, I've understood what that meant. Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. I just took the words on their face value. 
for the first time, I've come to understand what that means is, Abraham believed that out of what was dead, God can bring life. And when you think about when, when God uh, called, when those three visitors went to Abraham and said he's going to have a son, he was nearly 100 years old. I did say to my folk, you know, because our numbers are dropping terribly, and, um, you, you know, I, I thought it was time uh, uh, that they started having children again. I uh, didn't get much response, I'll be honest. Not that I can say I'm not added to it, have I? <laughs> but he, he was, and, and he said that Sarah's womb was dead. And out of what was dead, he believed that God could bring life. And he did. And a nation came to be. And I think we still have to uh, believe that out of what looks like it's dying, out of maybe what is dead, God can bring life. And I believe that for the church at the moment, and particularly the Methodist church. He's wrestling with the law, is, is, is Paul here. Because by God, he believed the law. He kept, he kept the law. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying we ditch the Ten Commandments. I'm definitely, definitely not saying we should ditch the Ten Commandments, which could be read into it. But what I'm saying is we need to realise that the law can't save us. That's what Paul had found. The law can't save us. And if you take what Jesus said, really, about the Ten Commandments, which we find in the Sermon on the Mount, he said... Love your neighbour. Love your neighbour. And hate your enemy. That's what the law said. Jesus said, love your enemy. Love your enemy and pray. Pray for them. The law is necessary to show us what's wrong, what is wrong. It's necessary to enable us to live together in society. But it won't save us. Do not murder. But it goes on to say, but if you're angry with your brother, uh, then that's murder. That's murder. That deserves judgment as much as anybody who's murdered somebody. Don't make an oath. I'm oh, sorry, do not break your oath. And what Jesus said to that was, you've heard it said, do not, break an, do not make an oath. But Jesus says, don't even make an oath. Don't even, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Mrs. Ward, who had a great influence on me in my early Christian life, um, good Pentecostal, and uh, she would never sign the pledge. She didn't drink, but she would never sign the pledge. She said, no, my yes is yes and my no is no. You don't sign an oath. And, and I, I, I admired her for that. The law, it says here in Romans, that it brings death. But the Spirit brings freedom and brings life. And the commentator I read, uh, one of the commentators I read around this said, that the, the, the law and the Spirit are two worlds, two realms, that are hostile to one another. Because the law will let you down but the Spirit of God brings freedom and life. The law won't give you a ticket to heaven. Do you know, I've been to church so many times this week. Do you know, I've visited uh, so many people this week. All oh, good, gracious stuff. Don't get me wrong, again. But it won't add up to a dot on Judgment Day. It won't. It's where do you stand with Christ? Where do you stand with Jesus. But many people think that Christianity is a faith just of morality. We alter our lives because we're Christians, not to make us Christians, I think Paul's saying. And I, I bet you don't hear it here, but I do in my ministry, where I go and people will say they've been in the church all their lives. And they'll say, you know, well, I hope. I hope that when I die, I'll be good enough to go to heaven. I hope that when I die, I get a place. <laughs> I 
And I, obviously, I'm preaching to you now that that doesn't work like that. And I preach like that at home, but people's ears don't always open to it. What we respond to is what we're going to remember in a moment or two as we share bread and wine. That sacrificial love that Christ uh, gave for us. And he's coming and living and dying. God's plan to bring us. And the law shows us what sin is, tells us what's wrong, tells us what's bad, what's not good for us. But the Spirit gives us the freedom to live a life that is full and purposeful. Paul was transformed by the Spirit of God. And again, for him, it, the understanding of it didn't come overnight. I, I, I was quite shocked when I discovered Paul had his Damascus Road experience and, um, and then he went away for 14 years and he worked out how he understood that given what he'd believed up to that point in his life. He was 14 years back home working through what he believed before he started his ministry to the Gentiles. So we have to do some work on it as well. But Paul saw how the, the, the Spirit had transformed his life. And he knew that he could stand before God and enter into that glorious rest that God promises us in Christ Jesus. Who enters heaven is God's job. That's his job. That's his purpose. But we know how we get there. I have a friend called Brett, and uh, Brett's been very close to becoming a Christian over the years. But every time he's said, but I want to live a bit before I do. A bit like Augustine, really. I want to live a bit before I commit my... I don't want to tie myself down to this boring idea of Christianity. They don't live, have they? They've got to experience it. Why wait? That was my thing. Why take the risk? You might not get to that point of decision before you're called home. But I do believe that God, as a God of love, reaches out. And I've been with people as they've been uh, on their deathbeds. And, and, you know, they'll say, you know, well, granddad came. Or my mum came. No, it's not, it's not. It's Jesus. Jesus comes. I remember being with an, an elderly lady. She didn't come to church. And Jesus was in that room. And that's what she could see. And uh, because he has to. If God so loved the world, if God is a God of love, he reaches out to the very last breath. And that opportunity is there for us. After that, after that, I think, I do honestly think that we are lost. That we are lost. So why wait? There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For Christ Jesus has set us free from sin and death. Will you live in freedom? Do you live in freedom? Believing that God will lead you through and through. And knowing when you get it wrong, and we do get it wrong because we are not perfect, even though as Methodists we believe in perfection, Yeah, that's something for my retirement to work out. <laughs> we do get it wrong, but God can work out even when we get it wrong. It's, nothing's ever wasted uh, in God's time and purposes. If Paul could be sure, if Paul could be sure we have the freedom in Christ... Can't we be sure and live in that way, rejoicing all that God has given for us, all that God has done for us, all that he will do for us and live as a blessing in the world because it is, this world needs us. Whether we're outside witnessing or not, it needs us in the world because at the moment the whole world is on the highway to work. You know, um, it's, uh, well, I never thought, I never thought 
in my time. I used to rejoice that I'd never lived in a wartime. And I know there's been wars over the years. But there's war in Europe now. And if Putin gets his way, if he wins, it's going to spread. It's going to come. We live in very strange times, I truly believe. But God is in control. And but the world needs you and me as believers in Christ to live in the world and witness for him uh, in our actions and our words. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's just pray for a moment. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us. And we thank you that we, we can't outgive what you have given. But we offer ourselves to you again and afresh uh, now in this worship. That at the beginning of this new week, whatever is before us, uh, we offer ourselves in your service. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll sing, I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. first recorded um, setting for communion. I'm going to read now from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let's just examine ourselves for a moment in the stillness, preparing our hearts to receive. So, Lord, as we examine ourselves, we, with great thanksgiving, come before you again, thanking you that you are the great creator God who created all that is around us, that you created this world with all its beauty, that you created human beings, made us stewards of the earth, And when we'd gone wrong, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be our saviour. We thank you for the salvation that has come uh, to our lives. We thank you for the truth that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so as we stand in him, we, we are glad that we can come to this meal. And we thank you, Jesus, that you instigated this meal as our remembrance of you. And that as we take it, we think of the sacrifice that you have made for the shed blood on the cross, for that separation that there was between you and the Father, but also for that resurrection that came on that first Easter that you, Jesus, have been raised to life again, and through your death you have paid the price of sin. And we rejoice too that, Lord, your Spirit is abroad within us and without us, that your Spirit is abroad in the world, present with us in these moments. The Lord, we might deal with the things that you want us to deal with as we refresh ourselves and renew ourselves in this sacramental service. So gracious God, we ask that you would pour down your spirit on this bread and wine, that there may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and through it we might be sustained, strengthened, encouraged in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me shall never die. And so, believing that, know that his peace is with you always. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all mankind. Amen. And we sing Wesley's great hymn, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood?
himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Tis mercy Diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose when forth and followed thee. My chains fell Condemnation now I dread Jesus and all in him is mine Alive in him I live So in the knowledge of that amazing hope, may the God and amazing grace, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll bless one another with the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.